I pray you guys are well. We continue to pray for all of you, uh, for your health, for your prosperity. We love you guys. We miss you. We'll be excited to see you once again. Let's pray. Lord, I love you. I thank you. I'm extremely excited the fact that you would send your son to die for me, that all my sins were forgiven that day. Even though I had not committed them yet, Lord, you said that your son was the lamb that was slain before time, and yet you knew that you were going to bring me forth from that resurrection, that he came not to serve himself, not to gain earthly possessions, but instead he lived a life that was to be exemplary in the fact that he came with one mission, one purpose, and that was to fulfill the destiny of God on, your, on our lives, on his life, to be able to have sons and daughters that would rise up with him. And I'm so grateful for the fact that I get to be a son today, that my family gets to be sons and daughters today, that you guys get to be sons and daughters today because of the blood that was shed, that went for all time to be able to heal my body, to be able to forgive my sins. I'm so thankful for what you did for us on that cross, Lord. And I thank you that you were willing to step out of a perfect heaven into an imperfect world. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And Lord, we have life and life more abundant because you were willing to give up yours. And so, Lord, I pray that I would do that that I would live a life that would be for your kingdom, that wouldn't be unto myself, but it would be unto you, and that everything I do would be as unto the Lord. I thank you for our pastor today. I pray that as he begins to open his mouth, that the very words of heaven would pour out, and our ears would be opened, and our eyes would be opened, because, Lord, we know that you're ever speaking, and that you're ever moving. Let our eyes to see, and our ears to hear, that we would know what to do, in this season that Lord it looks like a season that is we could say is down and out but Lord the greatest miracles are still ahead the greatest time in our lives could still be ahead if we would just listen and hear and know what you're doing I thank you for our pastor I pray that you would bless him overflow him I thank you for this church I pray that you continue to be over every single person and Lord let no disease come near any of us and Lord more than that let our lives to be ones that would shine for you in Jesus name we pray Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Good morning, little country church. Glad you joined us online this morning on holywild.tv, YouTube, or however way you've done it. Isolation, I was thinking about the, uh, the thought of it and all through Scripture. It's amazing how Scripture has come alive to so many of us during this time of, of um, this pandemic. But I, I thought about isolation. I thought about when... Uh, uh, Joseph was isolated in a pit and then into a prison and the things that he learned there. Thought about David when he went to the cave. He isolated himself and there 400 discouraged, discontent, in debt people found him and uh, he raised up a tremendous army. I think about even today isolation, uh, that it's, it is Easter. Uh, it's Resurrection Sunday and being that, I thought about the time that Jesus was isolated in the garden, isolated in Gabbatha, there inside the courtroom when he was uh, uh, beaten, slandered, spit upon. I thought about the isolation of the six hours on the cross and how that all led up to that. Again, no rest, no sleep. We're going to talk more about that today. But isolation has taken on a whole new meaning for us. And as I look among a, an empty building and I realize the church has been deployed, we're not empty, we're deployed. We're doing a lot of things out there, reaching a lot of people, connecting a lot of people. This morning, we want to take communion together. We want to remind ourselves, and so I want to give you just a moment uh, to go and to get some bread or a cracker, uh, get some juice or get a drink, amen, uh, and join with me and the skeletal crew that I have here uh, at the Little Country Church Crosby Campus. Oh, I miss you. Just let me say it. I miss you. I miss embracing. I miss shaking hands. I miss high fives. I, I miss the, the friendly uh, knuckles when we, we just kind of hit one another. I miss all that. And, you know, I, I think of Paul when he said that I long to embrace you. You know, there's something about this body of Christ. You know, the body is made to connect and to be together. Well, communion is common union, what we have together in uh, uh, understanding that this day is the day that set us all free. 
Thank God that he died on the cross. Thank God he resurrected. This resurrection day on Exodus chapter 12. I want you to look with your Bible. I'm giving you a little time to find the elements of communion. Exodus chapter 12, verse 13. It says, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Now, I look at this and I say, all right, God, if you can do it for the Israelites, you can do it for us. Last week, I, I mentioned in our second service, the drive-in service, how much David loved Israel. And he talked about Israel and, and that the peace of Israel. And it hit me. I, I, I pray for Israel. I pray for the peace of Israel. Well, let me say this. I pray for Texas. I pray for the United States. This is the land where God put me. This is the land where God has blessed me. Amen. And when I, I mentioned that, I wasn't trying to isolate other states. I just wanted you to love your state. Wherever you're at, you know, I'm from Alabama. I love the state of Alabama. But I love Texas. And I thank God for it. There are 29 million people in the state of Texas. 29 million. 11,400 have the virus. And that's including those with the flu. As you realize, they're putting, if you've got flu, they're just packing it all in there together and calling it COVID now. So you realize that's 0 .004. Not even a half a percent of the state of Texas has contacted the virus. Now, we've got to keep praying for New York. It's the hotbed. 40% of this virus is there. So we've got to pray for New York. Pray they figure this thing out. The, the blood of Jesus will cover that area. But I thank God for Texas. So maybe we're going to a little extreme here. But I want to tell you the blood. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Nothing more powerful than the blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus that washes whiter than snow. It was his blood on the cross that changed our lives. Amen. The blood. When they pierced his side, blood and water flowed. The church was born. Amen. I thank you for the house of God. So if you have your elements, I want you to reach to them. Amen. The scripture says on that night that he was betrayed. He took bread and he broke it. He'd already washed the feet of the disciples. One was to betray him. I want to remind you that this is a great day for you to forgive. Forgive betrayals. Forgive hurts and pains. Forgive the prison that you've been locked into. If you've gone through breakups and relationships, it's, it, this is the day to release it and let it go. Amen. Peter Simon Peter later said, by his stripes we were healed, the bread, the body. So I stand in the healing fountain of God. You know, I've, my week has been a little bit rough, I'll be honest with you. I've, I've had lower back trouble and not been able to even move, walk, or even put my socks on. This morning I put my socks on. It's Sunday. It's resurrection. God has resurrected my body. He's resurrecting your body. I'm praying in the name of Jesus, all disease... All plagues, all viruses, that by the stripes of Jesus Christ, we are healed. Amen. We thank you for the body. In Jesus' name. Now, I want you to take whatever cup you got, whatever it is that you're drinking right now. And I want you to realize that this is a symbol of the blood of Jesus. There is nothing more. When the blood broke loose at Calvary. When it hit the ground, the Bible says the tombs burst open and the dead got up and started walking around. That's one of the questions I got when I get to heaven. Pastor, I ain't even trying to figure that one out. I can just tell you there's nothing more powerful than the blood. There's nothing more powerful than his voice. When he spoke, clouds gathered nearby. When he said, I'm thirsty, the clouds gathered. I mean, Creation longs to do the bid of the Creator. There's nothing like the blood. When he said it's finished, the curtain in the temple rent from top to bottom. And God came out of the temple to hang out with his people. There's nothing more powerful than the blood. So, Lord, we thank you and ask you to forgive us of our sins. Oh, what a wondrous miracle it is to realize that we can be whiter than snow on this Easter morning. That you'd take your blood and apply it to lives and people that have had such sinful, hurtful. God, we've hurt people. We've 
America, you, you told us if we would turn from our wicked ways and repent, you would heal our land. So, Lord, I'm praying for the countries to bend a knee toward Jesus today. And God, to thank you for the blood. There's nothing more powerful in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. If you're in your house, why don't you just jump up and start running around in the couch and amen and hopping over the, the chairs and amen, waking up the kids and screaming and hollering, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, I forgive. Just get a little bit crazy. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Go throw some shoes in the dryer and let them pop, 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 and give God some praise in the utility room. Yes, you can. Go out out there. Go, go, go on outside and crank your, your, your car up and rev it up some in the name of Jesus. Get a little bit more excited. Amen. I'm telling you, ain't nothing more powerful than to realize that you've been paid in full. You have been forgiven. Let me, uh, let's get right into the Word of God. If you'd open your Bibles to the book of John, John chapter 1, verse 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. I, I love Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You know, Matthew gives us a broad scope of story. Mark is 16 chapters of excitement, man. It's full of excitement. If you just like to read about exciting things, that's Mark. He doesn't do a lot of details. Details, well, that'd be Luke. Luke, of course, was considered a doctor, so we see a lot more things with Luke. He's going to share his perspective. But 60 years after Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote, John looked back and said, I, I want to share some revelation with you, some understanding. Matthew starts with the birth of Jesus. Mark starts with the birth of Jesus. Luke starts with the birth of Jesus. But when you get to John, John said, I'm going to take you way back to the very beginning. In the beginning was the Word. Now, if I can tell you the Word was Jesus, that's the bottom line. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's why when I tell you that Jesus was God, I'm not lying to you. I'm not trying to develop a new theology. I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, Him, who's Him? The Word, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that was been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. You know, when Jesus came, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the, the life. Amen. That's who I am. So he never contradicted himself or what John said about him. The light shines in darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. If you go to 1 John, he says, he talks about us having that the reason we're brothers is because we have light one to another. John chapter 1, verse 10. Let's skip down a few verses for the sake of time. He was in the world, and through the world, he, uh, and, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, that's us Gentiles, Jews, whoever, to receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, when I, I look at the word of God, I realize something about him. The, the world was made. The scripture says in Genesis chapter 1 that the earth was void and God said. So when I look at in the beginning was the word, the word said, the word said, he spoke. And when he spoke, things began to happen. You know, the voice is an expression of thoughts and feelings. It has to be spoken to be expressed. The word became flesh. In other words, the, the word was a, a logo, if you would. This would be considered logos. It's just the word. But when it comes alive, it becomes rhema. It becomes something in you. And there are times you will read your Bible. Let's still go back to a, the, the book of Exodus chapter 12, verse 13. It says there that when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Well, for many people, that would just be a logo. That would be logos. But all of a sudden, when you hear that there's a virus in the whole world and it's affecting people, that word just became rhema. In other words, it came alive to us. I mean, last night, my wife and I, we put red uh, uh, bandanas over our doorposts to remind ourselves that the blood is covering our house. We looked after it. I saw other people doing the very same thing. It, it comes alive to you. There's, there's opportunity for you to look at the Word of God and say, you know, that right there, it doesn't mean a lot to me. But all of a sudden, you start going through something, 
it becomes alive. It becomes rhema to you. It becomes an exciting. So logo expresses the intent, the purpose, and the plan of an organization. But God said this time you wouldn't only hear the word, you're going to see the word. Hello, Jesus. Hello, rhema. And he began to walk around and present himself. One of the most repeated phrases in the scripture is he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit would say to the church. In other words, every one of us has an opportunity to pick up some rhema, to get hold of something that's going to change your life. Listen, there are times I will read out of Psalm 103, Psalm 107, and it's just about healing and stuff. But when you're sick, when you're down, when your back is aching and you can't move anymore, and all of a sudden it becomes rhema to you, that's what I've been praying for. And that's what I felt has happened to me this morning. The rhema of God has hit my life. Healing began to spring up. I'm going to be honest with you. These men can testify. I have not been moving well. I feel real good this morning. Maybe I'm under some type of crazy anointing. But whatever it is, I thank God that I got the rhema of God working inside of me. God said, I'm not just speaking to burning bushes, patriarchs, leaders, priests, or prophets, but to all the people that have an ear to hear. Listen, it is more of a miracle for something not to happen when Jesus spoke than for it to happen. Because when he said, light be, it be. When he said, wind be still, it got still. When he said, tree wither, die, it died. When he said, blind see, they see. When he said, dead rise, they rose. It's on the hill of the withered fig tree that Jesus spins and says to the disciples, I say to you, have faith in God. In other words, get on the frequency with me. Find out what I'm saying, amen, and get on the same frequency, and I promise you it will happen for you also. That's why when I say I see the blood, I'll pass over you. I, I'm, I'm telling you my house is plague-free, virus-free. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm almost to the point where I just believe you walk through. That's, that's why I tell folks, you drink after me, you get well. I know you think that's crazy, but I, I think it's crazy if you drink after somebody sick and you get sick. You walk through a house, it's virus-free, virus is going to leave you. I just, okay, that's just the way I think. Call me crazy or call me full of God. I don't care what you call me, but I, I'm going to tell you, I understand the Word of God. So when I'm reading this, at the cross, they pinned his hands. They pinned his legs. They removed the clothing from Christ. But all he had left was his voice. And he began to say some things at the cross they began to change lives. The scripture called it, Jesus said in Gethsemane, let this cup pass from me. Listen, it wasn't a sea of suffering, not a river of suffering, not even a pitcher or a jar of suffering. Jesus called it a cup of suffering. What he was saying was, I can handle this. It ain't a river, it ain't a sea, it ain't, it ain't a pitcher. It's a cup. I can handle this cup. Amen. I can deal with it. Jesus the, the carpenter, Jesus the man, peers into the dark pit and begs, can't there be any other way? And God says, no, it's got to be this way. And he says, okay, thy will be done. All of this is the stage for the battle of the ages. I've talked to you about the premiere. First, we had the preview that Jesus was going to die. And then all of a sudden, we saw the place. Golgotha, Gabbatha, Gethsemane, we, we walk through that, we're getting closer to the grave, and then the glory, notice all the G's there, if you're, a, if you're a student of the word, you know where I'm going here, and I see all of that begin to be laid out, and we realize that Jesus gets there to, the, to Golgotha, the place of the skull, did you know it was actually called the mouthpiece, when you looked at the skull, you saw the mouth there, so there he began to speak. Last week, we talked about the reconciliation when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. His first statement to the cross was not about himself or his pain, but he was looking at the people around him and said, God, Father, forgive them. There are people that do things, they don't even realize what they're doing. Forgive them. The second was to conversion, the thief on the cross. I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Whoo! If there's one thing that I'm seeing right now is you've got to deal with eternity. You've got to look at it because many people have, have this fear of, of what's going on in the world. And you've got to realize that if you died, what's going to happen next? Are you ready for it? So when Jesus looked at this man who knew he was going to die, he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, today, and we pressed on that last week, today. In other words, not tomorrow, today you will be with me. As soon as you pass away, you transition from this life to the next life. Then the next was the commission. Oh, I don't know. Can you handle? Can you handle the thought of him on the cross and looking down and seeing his mother? The woman who bore him, nursed him, loved him, defended him, 
The scripture says in John 19, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. The mother's, his mother's sister, his aunt Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. Now, I'm going to tell you, it was John that wrote this. and It was John that said, you know who Jesus really loved? It was me. <laughs> it was me. Mm -hmm. Amen. Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Now, I could preach a whole message on each one of these. I can't this morning, but I can tell you the commission was simply this. Take care of mama for me, John. Look after her. From now on, whatever she needs, I want you to take care of her. And he said to her, here is your mother. I've found in life that it's not always blood that connects us, but it is the blood of Christ that connects us. Amen. It's not my DNA. Though I love my mom, I've loved my dad, my brother, my sister, the family that God has given me that I was born into. But when I re read this, I realize that there are commissions in life where we as men and women take on other children, other people, other brothers and sisters, and we bring them into our life, and they become a part of our fold. And that's what Jesus did here with the commission. The last four sayings, now remember, he goes on the cross at 9 a.m. It's around 12 o'clock now. So from 12 to 3 he makes four more very powerful statements. The next one was the cry. When he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Mark chapter 15, listen to what he said. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When I think of what happened and the sins that I've committed, you've committed, We've, uh, the secret places in the darkness in our life began to be poured onto him. When you go from Genesis all the way up to the time that Jesus died, all the atrocities of man, the, the annihilations of, of whole tribes, the, the wickedness. Um, the, listen, I, I, the Bible doesn't cover it up. The rape, the dismemberment, the, uh, the abuse, the adulteries, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't whitewash anything. It says these things happen. Cain kills Abel. You, you have uh, Adam and Eve's uh, uh, disobedience in the garden. All of those sins begin to roll up upon Christ. And then if you go from Christ up to where we're at now, you see all the, the sins of man from, from Holocaust uh, uh, to, to the abuse of, of nation against nation, the, the wiping out, the, the infanticide, abortions, all of those things, all of those sins are rolled back upon him that would be. And the blood of Jesus began to wash all of us from our sin. When he, all the sin was put upon him, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there are times, I promise you, during this, this, this isolation, you have felt like God has left you. He's been away from you. I pr he has not. He's still there. Amen. He's closer than a brother. Amen. When you call upon him, he'll hear you. He listens to you. Amen. He, he connects with where you're at. 2 Corinthians 5 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. Isaiah 53, 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. Then thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. As the sins of the world, every disgusting act was poured upon him. My God, my God, why have you left me? Amen. That dark moment when Jesus, the Son of God, the Word of God, felt that. Amen. And he, he repulsed on the cross. He backed away. People had to look at him and say, what is going on here? And in my mind's eye, I realized that God had to do that for me. He had to do that for you so that you and I could be sons and daughters. He didn't have to do it, but he poured. He literally poured the sins, the abuse, the wickedness, the darkness upon him. Satan has to be laughing. The, the, the devils have to be circling like vultures at that moment. And then Jesus said, I thirst. When he said, I thirst, the clouds heard the voice. That voice that spoke, darkness came. It was like when G if Jesus would have said, uh, uh, let there have been light, more light, there would have been more sunshine. But when he said, I thirst, the clouds just gathered around him. And it was like they were waiting on permission to turn on the faucet and begin to drench Golgotha with rain. They were waiting on that moment. I thirst. And then he's the conquering. He said in John 19, verse 2, and I'm moving quickly here. But later he says, knowing that all these things were completed. 
so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, and the soldiers soaked a sponge in it. They put the sponge on a stalk on the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he received the drink, he said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The word is to tell us die. Over with, finished, accomplished. Uh, when Jesus said this, and I, I've heard it mispreached, where people said that Jesus said, I am finished. He didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. In other words, I came, you've, you've seen the movie. You, you saw uh, Malchus's ear get put back on. You, you, you saw Barabbas get free. You saw Peter's, uh, uh, but, uh, if you would, denial and, and, and Judas's betrayal. You saw the picture. All, it's all taking place before us. And now on the cross, all the things that he said. But when he gets to this place, it is finished. He was talking about the plan that God had. This, this, this premiere, as you see, the plan was very important. For you to understand, it was by the blood of Christ that all of us would be set free. It is finished. Amen. He, I came to do what my daddy told me to do. I finished it. It's not the sigh of a victim, but the shout of a victor. I believe he pushed himself up on the nail in, the, in his feet and yelled it out. Tetelestai, it is finished. When I came to do it, do you know I go to bed at night knowing that the plan of salvation for my life was finished? I have accepted what Jesus did for me on the cross of Golgotha. And because of that, I can have this peace and understanding that is not about my righteousness, amen, but because of the grace of God that I'm saved, that you're saved, that I can stand and this, this finished work of Christ and what he did. It's a voice of victory. Two things tore at the time. We mentioned them during communion. Matthew 27, verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open. Bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs. And after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake, and all that had happened, they were terrified and explained, surely he was the Son of God. I, I want you to catch this. From a hill, probably close to a quarter mile away from the temple, Jesus yells, it is finished! And his voice moves off of the hill, down through the valley, and there inside the temple, the Holy of Holies, they were sacrificing little lambs because it was Passover. It all just fell. Just coincidental? No, I don't think so. Amen. God had it planned. Amen. And while they were sacrificing lambs for the, to, for the sins of the people, according to the Old Testament traditions, the Lamb of God on the cross said it's finished. And when it runs up through that temple, God took that curtain. That curtain was as wide as the span of a man's hand. It was six to eight inches across. It hung it took over 300 priests to hang that curtain up, and God came in and took that wall of cloth. And the Scripture is very explicit about it. He tore it from top to the bottom. Amen. Ripped that thing in half. Just his words. What he said. What he said. It is finished. It tore in half. And, and some people think that was to let people in. No, no, no. It was to let God out. God said, I just want to be your God. I want you to be my people. I want to, the scripture says he lives inside of us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. All of these things took place. And then the grave started popping open. Now, I've seen a lot of scary movies. But can you imagine the tombs start popping open and people getting up and walking around? And the scripture says they went visiting. They went visiting. I don't know if they was hungry, if they wanted a hug. But can you see Uncle Si come back up in the house? Hey, Amen. Can you see people come walking back? It was like, are you kidding me? What happened? The blood, the blood, the blood. As soon as he said it's finished, his blood is on the ground. Hey, Amen. And salvation had come. People were popping up from the, in the Bible, it, it doesn't explain. Quit trying to explain something you don't understand. But I'm going to tell you, it was a type of what's going to happen someday. When the trumpet of God sounds and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Amen. We'll meet him together in the air and we'll always be with him. It's, it's amazing when I look at this and I see how the scripture. This is what convinced me. 
Well, I was a young man searching. I searched through other religions. But when I got into this book, and it became rhema to me, no longer just a logo, but, but rhema, amen, it began to open up. I began to understand this thing. It made sense. Amen. It layered upon layer. It was line upon line. I began to see it. And the longer I'm with God, I start seeing from glory to glory. It's taking place here. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 12 says, But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about uh, this first, he says. This is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Jesus gets to the cross and said, it's finished. Thank God for an empty tomb. Thank God for the resurrection. Thank God for Easter this day. When I read this scripture, I realize that God puts laws inside of us. You know when you got born again, that God starts putting things inside of you, and you, and you go, well, I didn't, rec- I didn't realize that. That's God, the Holy Spirit's talking through you, that this is good, this is not good. Amen. And you start picking up on it because you're walking with it. Then there was the last thing that he verbalized on the cross. Luke chapter 23, verse 44. It was now about the sixth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon. Darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. Tell me that if you were there, you had to recognize as that centurion did that this was the Son of God, that this was a righteous man. Again, I think in the crowd, not only are there the Marys there, not only the 11 disciples, but I see Barabbas and Malchus and so many others hanging out under the cross. And when that darkness covered over, they realized that this, this has to be the Son of God. Amen. For the sun stopped shining. The curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Which he had said this, he breathed his last. I read one scripture that says that after this, he laid down his head. Simply to put, he just said, okay, nobody took my life. I'm giving up my life. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This is that time in my life when I look at you and I would think to myself, have you committed your spirit to him? Have you asked him into your life? Have you decided, God, more than anything else, I want to make sure that I am secure, amen, that my life is good, that I know no matter what happens, you got me. That centurion's confession that he was a righteous man. It may look like your last hour. No hope. The sun has stopped shining. The fear of this virus. But with one sentence from our Savior's lips, he can tear through the curtain that has divided you from him. Amen. With one finger, he can tear it from top to bottom. You just have to commit your spirit. When you serve him with your body, let your mind, uh, let, let his mind be in you. All he had left was his voice. He couldn't use his hands or his feet. All he needed was his voice. You ever wonder what Jesus' death was like, seeing from the perspective of heaven? Amen. That there were those that had to be peering over the balcony, watching what was going on at Golgotha. Were it a war, this would be the aftermath. Were it a symphony, this would be the second between the final note and the first applause. Were it a journey, this would be the sight of home. Were it a storm, This would be the sun piercing the clouds. But it wasn't. It was the Messiah, and this was a sigh of joy. Father, Father, the voice that called forth the dead, the voice that taught the willing, the voice that screamed at God, now says, Father, Father, the two are one again. The abandoned is now found. The schism is now bridged. Father, he smiles weakly, it's over. Satan's vultures have been scattered. Hell's demons have been jailed. Death has been damned. The sun is out. The sun is out. It's over. An angel sighs. A star uh, wipes away a tear. Take me home. Yes, take me home. Take this prince to his king. Take this son to his father. Take this pilgrim to his home. He deserves the best and the rest. 
take me home. Come 10,000 angels, come and take this wounded troubadour to the cradle of his father's arms. Farewell, manger saint. Bless you, holy ambassador. Go home, death slayer. Rest well, sweet soldier. The battle is over. It is finished. He destroyed the power of death. Since the children have flesh and blood, Hebrews 2, 14, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. Do you know why there's a pandemic? People have a fear of death. My whole life for the last 40 years has been one of dealing with life and death. And I want to tell you, I stand on this resurrected Sunday telling you because of what he did on the cross and the resurrection of that third day that death no longer has power over us. There's no more the fear and the tyranny of it that he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He stands victorious over it. And when we transition from this life to the next, it's going to be a greater life than you've ever imagined. Eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered in the heart of man what God has prepared for those he loves. Amen. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. I'll say it again. He loves you. Easter proved it, demonstrated it. The Logos became Ramah. Died on the cross for us. Death no longer holds its power. There's no longer fear and tyranny of it. So I stand and proclaim it to you. He's resurrected for your sake and my sake. I rebuke the voice of Satan over your life. Amen. I say I stand with him. Hallelujah. What he did on the cross means more to me now than it did yesterday. It'll mean more to me tomorrow than it did today. I thank God for the cross. Father, I thank you for everyone that's watching this resurrection day. I ask your blessing to be upon them. Oh, how I miss the people of the little country church and my friends around the world. I long for the day to hold them, to embrace them, to shake their hands again. God, until that time, I rebuke the residue of fear, that which would try to hang on to us when this is over. God, that that work, would we be able to go back and do that work which you've called us to do? that the economy of America would stand up and be strong again. I thank you, Lord, for blessings. I thank you for going over and not beneath. I thank you, God, that we're blessed and not cursed. God, you said you set before us life and death, and we're choosing life today. I thank you again for the Word of God that's come alive in our hearts. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wherever you're at, would you just give God a sacrifice of praise, a little bit of an applause. Hallelujah. We thank you, God. The little skeleton crew that I have here, thanks for being here. Let me say to our church, I appreciate our volunteers. I appreciate the staff that is still working diligently throughout the week. Uh, 1030, we will be having a drive-in service at our new Candy campus. Would love for you to join us there. The weather, God has blessed us, amen, might have hurt some other brothers and sisters, but it's went north of us, so we should be able to get on the property. There on the property, a friend of mine by the name of Justin Gambino, tremendous musician, will be singing. Uh, I love Justin. He's local. He's supposed to be on tour right now, unable to go because of the shutdown and the isolation, so I invited him to come out and be part of our Easter celebration. So if you have opportunity, come on out. I pray you've already taken communion with us. I will remind you that this is a week. This is a week of giving. For God so loved, he gave his only begotten son. Easter was proof of John 3, 16. So I want to tell you that he's not only the God of the good times, he's God of the hard times. I've already this morning got up, wrote my tithe check out, Amen. Prepared it to give to the house of the Lord. Make sure as you look through this week, you realize that it was all about giving. Someone gave a donkey for Jesus to ride into Jerusalem on. Peter's house gave the supper, the last supper that he had before he went into Gethsemane. All through Scripture, we read that God is a God of giving. Giving is about honoring God. 
It's not about what, you know, whatever I have left. No, it's a dime on a dollar, a hundred on a thousand, a thousand on ten thousand. It's whatever that tithe is. God, I give it to you and also give you my service, my tithe and my talent. So as you prepare today online to give, amen, you can give through our, our app, Holy Wild Ministries. But I want to say this to you, and I've already seen this take. I know some people are getting laid off, but some are getting jobs and better jobs. Some are starting to find money that they never had before. Money and more money. Amen. More money, less hours of work. Well, a lot of you understand that. Now, benefits, sales and commission, checks are in the mail, gifts and surprises. You're going to find money. Bills are going to get paid off. Yeah, I'm smiling because I believe it's going to happen. Settlements and inheritance. Rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties will be received, favor, and the kingdom of God will be one of success. So stay in the kingdom. Amen. Find you a Bible-believing church. When this thing lifts, I know you've been watching people online. Find you a Bible-believing church. Connect with the body. Amen. Be, be a part of that life-giving moment. Would you do that? We're going to keep celebrating the King of Kings. Watch us on Facebook Live. We'll be on at 1030, 1035. You'll be able to pick us up out there. I love you. I'll miss you. And until next week, I say success to you. Expect success to the kingdom of God. Amen. Hallelujah.